Hello, is my mic working? Good. So I'm going to tell you something you're not expecting to hear, which is innovation is better in Africa than all these other places. Scandinavia, China, Iran. I mean, what a great story. I love that thing about where's your manager. Um, so first, let's just take a, bit, a step back and have a look at the context. 15 years ago, The Economist looked at Africa and called us the hopeless continent, and it was probably pretty true. But Within 10 years, something quite remarkable had happened, which is six of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world were in Africa. How do we know this is true? The economist told us. And you can see from this graphic the potential of our continent. It is, it is, it is really huge, second uh, largest on the, on, on the planet, but so many of these major economies could fit into just the size of the continent itself. And you've probably heard of this um, mythology, Africa Rising, right? I've spoken at maybe 10 different conferences called Africa Rising, remarkably, none of them actually in Africa. But <laughs> we are going through a pretty remarkable change. Hans Rosling, if you don't know him, the great statistician, he's probably the most interesting person ever to speak about numbers. He brings them alive in a brilliant way, uh, is a real authority. For him to say that this is the greatest change in our lifetime really is. And we are going to go from uh, a, a point of, of, of the dark continent to the hopeful continent, as the economist called us. 10 years later, and you can see from the statistics that we are at the same point where China was when its boom years began. We are going to experience the population dividend, this explosion of young people looking to do interesting things. And we have the secret ingredient that all economies need, right? The middle class. Of the 1.1 billion people in Africa at the moment, a third are already the middle class, right? very important people, the middle class. We are all the middle class. Why are we important? We buy smartphones, we buy apps, we use Uber or DD, uh, group buying websites, uh, we buy mortgages. You know, essentially, we buy shit. We are the people that keeps the economy going. I mean, if you don't believe me, believe him. Barack Obama was in South Africa about three years ago and the Cornerstone Initiative was a $7 billion power plan for the whole of Africa and at least he very honestly said the reason we want to do it, not only to uplift everyone's life, but also we need someone to buy our iPads. He meant iPads, he didn't mean iPods, don't look down on him. This is the, the airport in Namibia, I love this. Welcome to the future, welcome to Africa. You've got to say it like that, right? Um, because it is. I'm going to lead you through a whole bunch of things that, that, that are being done in Africa that are still in its infancy in the so-called developed world here in Europe or in America. You know, this is a picture of Johannesburg where I was born. This is in uh, 19... I nearly said this is a picture of Johannesburg where I was born in 1910. I'm looking very well. <laughs> Eat healthy, people. <laughs> Don't go in the sun. <laughs> Take your vitamins. This is the city I was born in a uh, hundred years ago, and it was a mining town. It was a town built on gold mining, the, the, you know, and, and that's what fueled that great resources super cycle that's just ended that caused those six out of 10 fastest economies to be in Africa. It was the stuff under the ground. I don't believe the gold is under the ground. I believe it's above the ground. I believe we, the people, are the gold. But more than anything else, the gold and the currency is mobile. Mobile has become this really remarkable communications device. It, it's the greatest thing that's ever happened to the human race, right? Coupled with the power of cloud computing, which means you don't really have to have a, a powerful phone in your hand, you just have to have a connection to the internet. Uh, the super fast broadband, which is starting to roll out everywhere. Uh, Africa, by the way, is the fastest growing mobile market in the world. Uh, we have more users than, than North America. And the power of the ability just to communicate with anybody anywhere. A useful analogy to understand how this is rolling out is to look at the, the railways of North America during their gold rush, right? You had uh, people landing on the 
the East Coast and gold found on the West Coast, and you needed to somehow join up the two sides of the continent, so along came the railways. Firstly, you had to build the infrastructure, right? You had to build the railways themselves. Then you needed all the ancillary industries, the coal, the wood, the water for the trains. Then you got uh, you know, all the, the little uh, villages and services. It's akin to the apps. This is where I'm going with the analogy. You know, you had the brothels, obviously the porn industry, very fast, online and offline. Um, and slowly everything else built up upon that until eventually the, you know, the infrastructure is really boring, which is where we are now. No one cares about the cell phone towers. And everything else that we can do on it is where the interesting stuff has happened. So let me show you the, the, the mobile epicenter of the world right now, or as I like to call it, Nairobi. It really does have that spaceship-looking building. And the reason Nairobi is doing so well is because of a couple of inventions. The first you've probably heard of is M-Pesa, right? M-Pesa is a mobile money currency. 80% of mobile money transactions in the world are happening in East Africa. How do we know this is true? The Economist told us. M-Pesa is so fantastic because it circumvents the problems that not having access to financial services or financial infrastructure happens, right? Africa has leapfrogged so many different generations of technology, not because we, you know, we, we didn't have them, uh, because we don't need them, but because we didn't have them. People didn't have desktop computers, no landlines, very few uh, traditional bank infrastructure, branches, etc. Why? Because we're a very poor continent and it costs a lot of money to build these things. So along comes this wave of technology that is virtual, that is cloud-based, that is based on your mobile phone and suddenly people can do remarkable things with it. So if you want to send five dollars or five euros to your you know, family who lives in the countryside of Sweden, no problem, you can send it via a bank transfer or an EFT. You know, do they have EFTs in Sweden? That was a joke. Or you've, you can find a way, right? In Africa, if you want to send $5 to your family who lives in a small rural village, the only way you can do it is with the bus driver. You know, if you want to send money, uh, migrant workers from South Africa want to send money back home to Zimbabwe, it, uh, it costs 30%. If you want to send 100 rand, you have to send 130 rand. And the 30 rand is for the driver and the other guy and this guy. But the remarkable thing is it only costs 30% because the money actually gets there within the trust system. And PESA is much more remarkable than a whole range of other mobile money systems because you can send money to somebody else using the most basic of technologies, which is SMS. That's the secret to its success. It uses SMS, which is by far the greatest communication medium the world has ever seen. It has a 100% read rate, even the spam. Anyone here got teenage children? Yeah? Those kids who don't reply, I'm sorry to tell you it's not because they didn't get it, because they don't want to, right? Everybody reads everything. So the most basic phones can get SMS. It's kind of like a check system for the mobile age. You can send somebody something and you can, you can collect it. Um, I took this picture in Salaam, by the way. I was taking a picture of this guy with his phone and he, he said, whoa, whoa, whoa put on his sunglasses and went, okay, now you can take the picture. <laughs> this woman standing in a field could be using M-Pesa. You can do everything with it. You can pay for school fees. You can buy groceries. I'm told you can even bribe customs officials. I, I was driving in from the airport in Nairobi and a beggar knocked on the window and said to me, you know, I said to him, I'm sorry, I, I haven't drawn any money. I was feeling all sorts of guilt and he took out his phone and he went, M-Pesa. But what she's definitely doing is using pay-as-you-go, right? How many of you go to a different country and at the airport buy a pay-as-you-go data sim? Yes? Yeah? Yeah? Thank you, for those honest ones amongst you. That 
was a business model that didn't exist until it was pioneered in South Africa in the early 1990s. Until then, you had to have three months of bank statements, a proof of address where you lived. All of these things are inaccessible to the vast majority of the world who just live below that kind of poverty line. They don't have a bank account. They don't have an electricity bill that comes to their home address if they have a home address. So pay as you go has come along and revolutionized the way people pay for things quite remarkably. I bet you didn't know that 40% of the ATMs in North America run on software written in Cape Town, for instance or that Amazon's EC2 uh, cloud software that powers the, the world's largest provider of cloud software was also written in Cape Town. And the most remarkable thing happening in scientific investigation in the world right now is happening in South Africa, which is the Square Kilometer Array, the SKA it's called, these big radio telescopes peering deep into space, not trying to find an Uber, but trying to find the origins of the Big Bang. And my favorite African innovation of all, which has no batteries, are these massive concrete blocks called dollices, right? They're these massive jumping jacks. You've been to a harbor, you've been to this harbor, you look out and there are these big blocks, right? And they have, without these, I believe the global shipping industry wouldn't be possible. Why? Because to offload and onload a ship, you need flat, calm water, right? If there are waves, you need what's called a breakwater. Uh, and the breakwater in most harbors around the world are made out of these. And the, the story behind this is just pure innovation. And this is how I define innovation. It is solving real problems, you know. Banks rebranding their uh, financial packages is not innovation, no matter what they tell you in the advertising. Don't believe it. You know, solving real problems is what real innovation is. You know, you see these, these uh, apps coming out of Silicon Valley that the New York Times said basically do for you what your mother used to do before you moved out of home, right? The kinds of things we see coming out of Africa are solving amazing problems. Uh, it's sometimes called frugal innovation or innovation out of necessity. And this is what is so important because the problems that we have in Africa are very significant. Not, not the, the biggest of which is, of course, power, access to electricity. More people have a cell phone, 500 million of them, than have access to electricity in Africa. The World Bank says one and a half billion people on the planet don't have access to electricity. So these dollars, it's a brilliant story. In 1963, uh, a harbor in a little small town called East London was ripped up and this guy, Eric Merrifield, who's the most famous inventor you've never heard of, was looking at his kids playing with, uh, with the bones of an oxen, right? Uh, and uh, the, 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 the fur trekkers who, you know, the Dutch immigrants who moved up through the country on ox wagons, when the oxen died, they used to eat everything and then they used to give the bones of the spine to the kids to play with, right? This is nose to tail eating long before the hipsters came along. And he was watching his kids playing with these little dollars and he realized this would solve the problem, which is uh, the, the fact that the, harp, the storm had ripped up the breakwater. He never patented them, they're open source. And as a result, the global shipping industry is possible. That's Robin Island in the background over there, by the way. So we have significant problems you know, not least of which that we've been in a state of civil war for a long time. But the power of the internet, as this World Bank statistic shows you, can uplift a whole bunch of things. And it's not being done with fancy phones like this. Just by show of hand, who has an iPhone? Who has an Android phone? Is there anyone brave enough and honest enough to admit in public they still have a Blackberry? Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> it's not devices like this that, that the remarkable things are being done. It's with devices like this. These very basic feature phones, right? That's, uh, Nokia still has massive market share, despite not, uh, your neighbors, right? Just next door. Despite not having a handset division anymore. And the great thing about these basic devices, this is called the 105. I love this thing. It's my spare phone when I travel. It has all of the things you need for 
uh, working in Africa, right? First, we've got great battery life. 35 days. <laughs> days. <laughs> but that's not all. <laughs> iPhone makes it to lunch, right? <laughs> It's got a built-in radio, because radio is still the killer app. It's the greatest broadcast medium still. Uh, and it's got a built-in torch, really. And it's cheap. It costs about $15. I asked a waiter in Nairobi once. I said to him, tell me about your phone. What do you do with your phone? What's important? He was, you know, all the obvious things. I do this, I do that. And I, he said, and it's an asset. So I said, oh, how, like how so? You know, it's a $15 phone. And he said, well, when times are tough, I sell my phone and then I, you know, take my SIM card out, I wait a week or two and I buy another phone. That is the way to think about what's called the bottom of the pyramid, right? The very poorest of the poor and how they use things and the entrepreneurial mindset around them. This is a picture I took on my way back from my honeymoon uh, about a year and a half ago in Zanzibar. We were driving to the airport. I, I stopped the driver and I went back to take the picture. And this guy, this barefoot guy walked past, right? And I checked with the driver. This is a, a place where people have to get water. Uh, barefoot people have to get water in bottles because there's no running water. And yet there are four ways to use mobile money in this place. Has anyone ever used Apple Pay? Google Pay, Samsung Pay, yeah, I'm sure you're lying. And yet, in you know, the third world, mobile money is something everybody does. So whenever you talk about Africa, whenever you talk about Africa, you have to, pick up, you, you have to look at this map, right? This map of innovation, or this map of, of, of space. And I don't think so. I think it's a map of innovation. And it's a very easy to read map, right? Everywhere there's electricity, there's no innovation. Why? Because what are people doing? They're watching television or playing ang uh, Pokemon Go, you know, or trying to understand Facebook's privacy policy. <laughs> Where there's no electricity, that's what's happening. People are inventing really brilliant things. Thank you very much. Thank you.